Good morning. This is your Stat Sensei, Mr. Spensei, and this is extra credit um, exam B, and we're going to do problems 10 through 20 on uh, this particular video. So a high school physics teacher was conducting an experiment with his class on the length of time it will take a marble to roll down a slope shoot. The class ran repeated trials in order to determine the relationship between the length and centimeters of the slope shoot and the time in seconds for the marble to roll down the chute. A linear relationship was observed and the correlation coefficient was 0.964. After discussing the results, the teacher instructed the students to convert all of the length measurements to meter, but leave the time in seconds. What effect will have this on the correlation coefficient? The answer is it won't. We didn't change anything, but uh, we did not change the relationship. We just changed our uh, units, changing of units, multiplying. If you multiply everything by a constant or add a constant, will not impact the correlation coefficient. So the correlation coefficient is not going to be impacted by this. The correlation coefficient would be only impacted is if we actually had the data change. If the initial thing was different because we changed the variables, that might happen. Um, but here, all we did was multiply by a constant. Actually, we divided by a constant in order to convert um, convert centimeters to meters. All right. So, because the standard deviation of lengths and meters will be one hundredth of the standard deviation, uh, will decrease. No, we will not change. We will not have a decrease in the correlation. The correlation will remain the same because the standard deviation of lengths and meters will be one hundredth of the standard deviation. The correlation will decrease. No, the correlation is not changing. Because changing centimeters to meters does not affect the value of the correlation, the correlation will remain 0.964, and we have a winner. So the answer number 10 is C. All right. Once again, correlation will not be impacted by changing the values. Of adding constants or multiplying by a constant. In this case, we were dividing by a constant and it won't change things. Uh, the relationship will be the same. All right. Julian generates a sample of 20 random uh, integers between zero and nine. So they're telling us our sample size is 20. She records the number of sixes in the sample. Well, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's 10 values and the probability of getting a six is 1 over 10 or 0 0.10, all right? She repeats this process 99 times. So that's our number of trials. That's not our sample size, that's our number of trials. Recording the number of sixes, what kind of distribution? Well, we have a fixed sample and we have a fixed probability. So this is a binomial distribution with a sample size of 20 and a probability of 0.1. All right, um, the next thing, number 12. So the answer to number 11 is, uh, is C. Number 12, the table above shows the sample size, the, the mean and median for two samples of measurements. What is the median of the combined sample of 47 measurements? Well, I can add means. So I could add means and I could weight them and that would be fine. Um, but here, um, I have medians. The only way I can do medians is I have every single value and line them up least to greatest. So I cannot do that. It cannot be done because we don't have the information for medians. I'd have to have every single value. All right. Now, on the mean side, we could do that. We could go, well, the mean's a weighted average, and we have 27 values. I mean, we have actually... Um, N1 plus N2, and so that means we have 47 values. So we're dividing by 47, and I need to weight them. I have 21 with an average of 42.6, so 21 times 42.6, and plus 26 times 49.2. So if they'd asked for, if they'd asked for the mean, I could have done it. But they didn't ask for the mean. That would be the mean right there. I can't do, but I can't do the median. I have to have every single value. So that one's not possible. So 12 is E, cannot be determined.
Dan, a trainer at the popular gym, um, was interested in comparing levels of fitness of students attending a nearby community college and those attending a four-year college. He randomly selected a sample of 320 students from the community college. And the mean and standard deviation of their uh, fitness were 95 and 10. So we have a sample X bar of 95 and an S of 10, an N of 320. Dan also selected a random sample of 320 from a four-year college. The mean and standard deviation of their fitness scores was 92 and 13. So X bar 2, S2, and we have an N2 of 320. They conducted a two-sided t-test that resulted in a t-value of 3.27. There's a couple ways to go about this. I'm going to go ahead and run the entire test, but then I'm going to come back and show you something else that could have been done. So stat, test, and we have a two-sample t-test. And we have 95 score from the community college with a standard deviation of 10, sample size of 320. From a four-year school, 92 with it was the X bar, 13, and 320. And then we had a two-sided test, so not equal to what they told us, because they said it was uh, two-sided. We never pool. We're going to calculate this. And I end up getting that T value that they talked about, a 3.27. And I mean, I, the T statistic of 3.27 and a P value of 0. 0.0011. All right. So in this particular case, we know uh, with that P value, that is a very small P value. The P value is less than alpha. So because it's less than alpha, we're going to reject. So what would have been our null hypothesis? Because it really helps to have that. Mu1 equals mu2. So mu, mu of the community college equals mu of the four-year college or alternative. Mu of the community college does not equal mu of the four-year college. So in this case, um, we're going to reject this and believe that there, uh, that there is a difference. So because the p-value is, is less than 0 0.05, and we said we had a p-value of 0 0.011, we're going to reject the null, and we're going to believe that they are significantly different, okay? All right. A researcher wishes to test a new drug developed to treat hypertension, high blood pressure. A group of 40 hypertensive men and 60 hypertensive women is to be used. The experimenter randomly assigns 20 of the men and 30 of the women to the placebo and the rest of the treatment. The major reason for separate assignment to men and women. Wait a second. We broke them into two groups. And remember, if it's an ex and here we're assigning treatment. So this is an experiment. So we blocked. So we have a block. And we have men and women. And here we randomly assigned placebo drug, and we did the same for the men. All right, placebo, that should have been a P, that's placebo, and this is supposed to be D for drug. We should have had the same thing on each side. So block, why do we block? We block because there's a characteristic that we think might impact it, all right? So, not because it's a large study, the new drug may affect men and women differently. That looks pretty good to me, I like that. The new drug may affect hypertensive and non-hypertensive people differently. We didn't, um, we did not break them down that way. We broke them down into all hypertensive, and we broke it by men and women. So we blocked on men and women. So that one's wrong because we did not block it by hypertensive and nine. It's not a matched pairs design because we didn't test each person twice. There's no natural merit pairing. There must be an equal number. That's not necessary. All right, so. The only thing it could be is that we blocked on men and women because we think the drug may impact them differently. So our answer to number 14 is B. Number 15, the histogram below represents the distribution of five different data sets, each containing 28 integers, one through seven. The horizontal and vertical scales are the same for all graphs. Which of the graphs represents the data with the largest standard deviation? This is something we could draw boxes and try and figure it out. 
but it's much easier than that. The more data we have away from the center, the larger our standard deviation. So if I have something that looks like goalposts, I have the largest standard deviation. And if I have something that everything is at one single point, I actually have a standard deviation of zero if I have all the same values. So this will have the largest, anything that looks like this, and this will have the smallest. The more in the center, the, the smaller, the more in the tails, the larger. This one has the most in the tails, most away from the center. It says the most data away from the center. So this right here, number 15 is D. It'll have the largest standard deviation. Number 16, Lynn is planning to fly from New York to Los Angeles and will take um, airtight airlines flight that leaves at 8 a.m. The website she used to make her reservation states the probability that she flight will arrive on time is 0 0.70. Huh. So 70% chance that it's going to arrive on time. Of the following, which is the most reasonable explanation uh, for how that probability could have been determined? Well, generally speaking, they looked at what typically happens and they go, well, we had this, when this happens, uh, we had this many successes. So by using an extended weather forecast for the date of our flight, which shows a 30% chance of bad weather, no. I mean, that's not bad, but I don't think that's it. By uh, making assumptions about airplanes work, no, they're, that's just crazy. From the fact that all the airline flights arrive in California, 70% arrive on time. Um, that's possible, but this is California, and she's not flying to California. She's flying specifically to Los Angeles. So that's not horrible, but I would like it to have been to um, Los Angeles. For the fact that of all airline flights in the United States, 70% arrive on time, uh, that's, again, we're generalizing to the U.S. and not to Los Angeles. From the fact that on all previous days, this particular flight – the one from, when I say this particular flight, the one that flies at this time from New York to Los Angeles has arrived on time 70%. This one controls for more variables because it basically says, hey, you know what? We're only looking at this specific time and this specific location from New York to Los Angeles. Everything else was broader than that, all right? So basically, based on all the possible days, the ones flying from, Los Angeles, New York to Los Angeles at this time, 70% arrive on time. So 16, the best answer is E. And again, please remember, we're always looking for the best answer. Okay, number 17 is a chi-squared. So we may not have gotten to it by the time you watch this video. An experiment, uh, to, in an experiment, two different species of flowers were crossbred. The resulting flowers from this crossbreeding experiment were classified by color a flower and stigma into one of four groups as shown in the uh, table below. All right, so we have this. And a bio biologist expects that the ratio is 9331 for flower types 1, 2, 3, and 4, respectively, would result from this crossbreeding. From the data above, a chi squared value of 8.04 was computed. Are the results inconsistent with the ratio at the 5% level? So basically, in this case, we're working with a chi-squared goodness of fit, and there's a couple different ways to work this, but they've given us some information. So let's go with what they've given us. First off, chi-squared, all chi-squareds are skewed to the right and begin at zero, at least for our case. We end up with a value. They tell us our chi-squared value is 8.04. So I'm looking for, once again, the area in the tails. And if that area is um, less than 0.04, I reject. So, but what is my null? null. HO is going to be, is consistent. HA is not consistent. So we went from, it matched it matches the claim. It does not match the claim. So we need to find that out. If we have a small p-value, we're rejecting. Well, there's a place on the calculator that everyone will forget. So I hope you watch this video. Uh, so second vars, and I can go to chi-squared. And once again, we never use PDF in this class. We always use CDF. Well, 
for, for the chi-squared. And we have a lower bound of 8.04, and then we're shading up to 999. What are my degrees of freedom? Well, for a chi-squared goodness of fit, it's categories minus one. One, two, three, four categories. Not the sample size, but the categories. So four minus one, which happens to be three. And when I do that, I end up getting a small p-value, 0.045. So 0.045 tells me I'm rejecting the is consistent, and I believe that it is not consistent. So are the, ver are the results inconsistent? Yes, they are not consistent. So that gets rid of all these because these are no's. Well, when do we reject? Well, if we were looking at a normal curve, And we had a 95% confidence interval. I mean, not 95% confidence interval, but a 5% alpha. We would reject if we had one anything greater than 1.96. So anything greater, we reject. So in this case, we have a critical value that is greater. We don't. We're not talking about the p value. The p value is smaller, but the critical value is greater. The chi square, and because we're talking about the chi squared value, we're saying a critical value. So what's the probability that our test statistic is greater than some critical value? What's the probability, if it were normal, of having a test statistic greater than 1.96? In this case, we don't know what the test statistic is, and we don't have a good way to do it. So, um, But we do know that we are out in the tail. Okay? All right. So number 17 is A. Number 18, I don't like this problem. There's a lot of reading. 100 people were interviewed and classified according to their attitude towards small cars and their personality type. The results in the table, uh, the results are shown in the table below. All right, so we have personality and type A and B and attitudes towards small cars, positive, neutral, and negative. We have 100 people that were surveyed. All right, and that's what they told us. Of the three attitude groups, the group with the negative attitude has the highest proportion of type A. All right, so let's look at that. We have um, 60. Um, of the three attitudes groups, all right, um, type A. So we're looking at, wow, I have, I'm going to need to pause this for a moment. I think I wrote down something wrong, so let me pause for a second. Yep. I, well, good thing I went back and looked at that because I definitely wrote something down. So of the three groups, so from the group, so from the positive group, the group with the negative attitude has the highest proportion of type A. Well, for positive, we have 25 over 37. So let's take a look at that. 25 divided by 37. And we have 67%. So this is about 67%. Then we have... For the neutral group, we have 11 out of 20, so 11 divided by 20, and that's 55%. And then for the negative group, we have 24 divided by 43, and that's about 55.8, about 56%. So that's not true. The type A is primarily going to be in the positives because 67% of that, that's false. Of the three attitude groups, the group with the neutral attitude has the highest proportion of type B. All right. So in this case, we have, um, so we're going to look at the positive. So we have 37 positives, 12 over 37. So let's look at that real quickly. 12 divided by 37. There's my positives, all right. For our neutral, we have 9 divided by 20. So that's 45%. So definitely um, the neutral is greater than the positive. And then for the negative, we have 19 divided by 43. And we have 44%, which is slightly less. So in this case, the neutral group has more type Bs and it turns out the number 18 is B because um, 
uh, of that. There's one other thing is I want to talk to show you real quickly. It says more than half of the 100 respondents have a type A personality and an attitude towards small cars and a positive attitude. And tells me intersection. So in this case, it would actually just be that singular value of 25 over 100. That's 25%. Can't be that. All right. But I'm a I have a feeling that that particular question might mess people up. So I wanted to show it to you. All right. So 18 is B. Number 19. A delivery service packages into two. And this is this one is more of a logic problem, although it does deal with regression a, uh, and correlation. Del delivery service places packages into large containers before flying them across the country. These containers vary greatly in their weight. Suppose the delivery service airplane always transports two of these packages. So I'm going to call package X and package Y because I'm not being creative. The two containers are chosen so that their combined weight is close to but does not exceed a specified weight. Let's just pretend they can't exceed 100 pounds. All right. Um, uh, a random sample of flights with these containers is taken and the weight of each container on each selective flight is recorded. Well, if I can't exceed 100 pounds, I could have two packages that weigh exactly 50 pounds. I could have one package that weighs 100 pounds and one package that weighs zero. All right. And when I look at that, it's like, oh, I have a negative relationship. Now, we, it says it's close to, but it won't exceed. So we're going to be somewhere below this line, but we'll never exceed it. So we'll have a negative relationship. All right, because we're going down. So because it's going down, it's negative. And uh, so our answer is we'll have a negative relationship or a negative correlation. As one box gets bigger or heavier, the other one has to get smaller to compensate. So the answer to number 19 is B. Number 20, which of the following is not a characteristic of a stratified random sample? Well, remember, remember a stratified random sample breaks them based on a common characteristic. And once you break the groups into common characteristics, let's say freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, you randomly select from each one of the groups. So random sampling is a part of the, the sampling procedure. Yes, after you've broken them into groups, you randomly select. So that's true. The population is divided into groups that are similar on some characteristics. Yeah, we put all the freshmen in one group, all the sophomores in one group, juniors, et cetera. So it's broken on a, a specific characteristic. The strata are based on facts known before the sample is selected. Yes, I know you're a freshman, or and I know you're a sophomore, and I know you're a junior. So I do know those facts. All right. Each individual unit in the population belongs to one and only one of the strata. You can only be a freshman. You can't be a freshman and a senior at the same time. You're going to be in one group or the other. Every possible subset of the population of the desired sample size has an equal chance of being selected. No, this is true for only one group. This statement right here is, is true for a simple random sample, true for a simple random sample where everyone's name was put in a hat and drawn. So only a simple random sample achieves that. Um, that is basically the definition that distinguishes a simple random sample. Um, and there are, no uh, there are no special cases of simple random sample. Yes, stratified uses randomization, but it is not a simple random sample. All right, I appreciate you watching. Hope to see you on the next one. Thank you.